Two Minute Tennis. I am so excited to give you three single strategies and three double strategies that are absolutely going to help you win more matches. Uh, I am live right now, though you'll probably be watching this when it is recorded and uploaded. Uh, but actually, let me get my sheet here with my strategies. And number one, we're actually going to start with singles. And we're going to start with the idea that when you return serve, that it's in your best interest to return serve up the middle. All right, so we're going three single strategies and three double strategies. So there are so many strategies you can use, but what I want to do is simplify some things for you as a singles player. And number one is I want you to return serve in play more often. Way too many players are super afraid of double faulting, but they don't think about returns that they're missing. So the idea is really simple. When you return serve, I want you to return up the middle against especially strong first serves and maybe difficult second serves. So here's strategy number one to win more singles matches. Let's say this is you. Your opponent has a strong serve. Maybe you're struggling with your return to serve that day. I want you to return back up the middle. It might seem extremely passive. It might seem way too safe, but I actually want you to watch the pros and watch how often the return is hit back down the center third of the court. Here's my challenge for you in your next match. When you are preparing to return serve, and yes, if you're watching this right now, you are live, so feel free to comment and I will gladly answer the questions that you write on the screen. Um, when you return serve down the middle over and over and over again, and, and it, it has to be a concerted effort. It has to be something that you're actually doing on purpose. So I know for myself, if I'm playing a match, I'm lining up to return serve, and I am in my mind actively returning down the middle. You will be shocked how the, the percentage chance of breaking serve increases. In fact, as a coach, this is one of the drills I do with my students. Uh, I will actually, let's say this is me serving and this is my student who I'm teaching. I will just have a bucket of balls here and I'll put cones right here. And I'll have cones that they have to return back between those cones. So I'll serve and they hit it back between these cones. If they do, they get a point. And if they miss, I get the point. And we'll play, you know, first one to 11. I serve to them. If they return it back between those cones, they get the point. If they miss and they hit to the outside, then I get the point. I've had students who come to me after I've given them a lesson or whatever, and they say, oh, Ryan, my, my serves are doing really well. I'm double faulting less. And I say, that's awesome, right? But in, whenever I hear that, I, in the back of my mind, I always think, I wonder if they're keeping track of how many missed returns they have. Because to me, there's no difference between missing a serve and missing a return. And the reason is because the first opportunity you have to touch the ball, you are not putting the ball into play. So it's great if your percentage of serves in play is increasing, that's awesome. But are you missing too many returns? Because if you're missing the return too often because you're going for too much trying to hit to the corners or because you don't even have a target, then it's important that you're hitting down the middle more so that you can break serve more often. If you want to break serve more often, you have to get more returns in play. So that is strategy number one when it comes to three single strategies we're going to talk about. And then in, uh, after that, we're going to talk about three double strategies. Return serve back up the middle more often. In addition to being more consistent, what you can actually do also is minimize the angle that your opponent has on that second shot. So kind of that serve plus one idea. Let me see if there are some comments. I know that there was a comment that was just written. Let me see here. Here we go. Righty or lefty? I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you asking if I am a righty or lefty uh, TM? 
I am right-handed. But we wanna hit back up the middle. So the next singles match you play, here's my challenge. Hit every return of serve back up the middle and watch how your consistency goes up and the likelihood that you break serve goes up. And the only way you can win a match is to break serve. If you never break serve, you can't win a match. You can get it to a tiebreaker maybe if you, everyone just keeps holding, but you have to win points against your opponent's serve in order to win a match. So hit down the middle and the chances of winning go way up. All right, number two is you should be varying the height you aim over the net. Uh, and really quick, big shout out to my kids, Mikey and Bella right now. I know they're watching this. So thank you guys for your support and daddy loves you. All right, so here's how it works. When you are, oh, let me, where is my, I'm trying to look for, oh, here it is. I have this like orange pine saw stuff that actually helps clean the board. Okay, when you are hitting, it is really important that you vary the height over the net with all of your shots. Let me ask you a really simple question. What percentage of the time when you're hitting a shot, forehand, backhand, whatever, what percentage of the time do you have in your mind a very specific height you are trying to hit over the net? What percentage of the time? I'm not asking what percentage of the time do you hit your target? Because who knows if we hit our targets, right? But what percentage of the time do you have a target? Because every time, 100% of the time, you hit the ball, you need to have an air target that you're trying to hit. And I'm not talking inches. I'm not saying like, oh, I'm trying to hit 48 and a half inches over the net. That's not what I'm saying. I'm thinking like very simple, low, medium, or high. In my experience, players really only have a target when it comes to height over the net when they're going for a lob. When players are going for a lob, then they think, okay, I'm gonna hit this ball high. But typically players do not have an air target over the net. And this actually is a game changer for consistency. So let me give you a very blanket statement. As you, let me tilt this down a little bit. As you move, so this is you. As you move forward, inside the court to hit the ball, hit lower over the net. As you move forward inside the court, hit lower over the net. And by the way, that's really the same for, typically the same for uh, doubles as well. As you move back, you need to aim higher over the net. And the reason is very simple. I uh, learned a lot from you from Malaysia. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it, Red Neil Cowboy. I love it. Thank you so much. So the number one mistake players make is hitting the net. I mean, there are four places to miss. You can miss in the net, left, right, or long. And obviously you can miss with a combination of those two, you, right? You can miss long and to the side, but those four basic directions, right? So the net is the most common mistake. In fact, it accounts for, in recreational tennis, over 50% of the misses. And the reason is because gravity is pulling the ball down. Gravity is not pulling the ball left, right, or long. Gravity pulls the ball down. So when players do not account for gravity, they end up hitting the net way too much. Let me move this back a little bit. I think it's maybe a little hard for you to see the screen. There we go. I think that's better, or the, the board. So every time you hit the ball, you need to vary the height you are hitting over the net. So maybe in your next tennis lesson, ask the coach to very simply, this is your coach, and he or she, they are feeding the ball either short, bringing you in, or high and deep, and maybe pushing you back. And I want you to practice varying the height that you hit over the net. And the reason is because when you move forward, it's very easy to not account for the fact that the court is shorter and the ball actually ends up going long. I know I said that we end up hitting the net more often than anything else, but the most common mistake players make when they move forward is they hit the ball long. So if you aim lower over the net, then you will be more consistent. And then as you move back, the court is now longer so the most common mistake is players hit the net. 
So what we want to account, the way we account for that is hitting the ball higher. What I typically see is that players vary the speed they hit based on moving in and back. So to give you an example, what I see in recreational tennis is when players move forward, they hit the ball a little softer to try to be more consistent. So they hit the ball softer to account for the shorter court they have to work with. And when they move back toward the back fence, they end up hitting the ball harder to try to account for the longer distance that they need the ball to travel. Instead of changing the speed you hit, rather change the height you hit. So again, if you're taking a lesson or if you're working on your game, here's something I used to do with the juniors at the tennis club where I used to coach. Shout out to Doylestown Tennis Club. The, the idea was if the student was inside the baseline, they hit lower over the net. And if they were behind the baseline, they hit higher over the net. It is that simple. Are there, of course, exceptions to this? Yes, and I could give you a dozen of them right now, which I'm not going to. I'm just trying to make very simple blanket statements here. Of course, there are exceptions, especially with where your opponent is standing. But the idea is simple. As you move inside the court, aim lower over the net. As you move back behind the baseline toward the back fence, aim higher over the net. Of course, there are exceptions. I'm just talking about typically when you're in a baseline rally, you and your opponent rallying back and forth. Vary the height you hit over the net. Man, oh man, is this gonna make you so much more consistent. And the last single strategy I'm gonna talk about right now, and by the way, if you have any questions, please throw them in the comments. Uh, does it make a difference if you are right or left eye for serve foot positioning? Love your tutorials. So I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of talk about left eye, right eye dominance. I think it has a um, great benefit to tennis players. But what I will say is there's a little bit of putting the cart in front of the horse when it comes to that idea. I think the greatest benefit actually comes from making these types of changes in your game. If, uh, if you wanna make a very fine tuned adjustment understanding about which eye is dominant. You got Federer with left eye dominant. It's much easier for him to keep that head super still because of that. Then, then you can make slight tweaks. But in my opinion, the average club player, the player who watches the videos of coaches who talk about that, and you know who that coach is who talks about that all the time, um, they have much bigger fish to fry than worrying about technique based on left eye and right eye dominance. Um, but, I, but, I, but I understand what you're saying. I would do this first before you even worry about, about uh, those ideas. The last idea has to do with rectangle and square. And this is a really simple concept. Now, don't hold me to this because the shapes aren't actually correct. Um, but it's just a nice way of thinking of it. So the rectangle square idea is, and if, I'm going to draw this if you're right-handed first and then if you're left-handed second. But... The goal is that the tennis court for you is not cut into a left half and right half right down the middle. And that if anything on this side, if you're right-handed, this is your backhand, and then everything on this side is your forehand and the reverse if you're a lefty. But instead, to actually use different size shapes in order to do this. So we actually are gonna put the line here. Oops, sorry. Oh, I think I used the wrong marker. Give me one second. Let me see if this one's working. Yeah, 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 good, good, good. So here is the rectangle and here is the square. The idea is very simple. If you get a ball, if you, this is if you're right-handed, if you get a ball in this area, this is a forehand that you're not going to accept a ball from your opponent landing here and you hit it as a backhand. I do not want you hitting the same number of backhands in a match as you do forehands. I don't want you doing that. As, well, if your backhand is your strength, then you need to hit more backhands, but typically the forehand is the strength. So the idea is simple. Anything that lands in the rectangle, you are going to hit as a forehand. 
So if the ball is going to land here, do not hit a backhand. Move around it and hit a forehand. There are many benefits to the benefits. Obviously, you're going to be hitting your strength, but there's also a benefit of being able to change direction. You can either hit inside out or you can hit inside in very easily. I've given lessons to players and they allow a ball to come directly to their backhand. I mean, hit a ball directly to Nadal's backhand. He doesn't have to move to hit a backhand. Is he gonna hit a backhand? No, he's gonna move around and he's gonna hit a forehand. So are you moving around? It's what I call manufacturing the shot. You're, the ball is not being given to you. You're making the situation be ideal for yourself. So when a ball lands anywhere, this is right-handed, it's gonna be reversed as a lefty. If any ball lands in this area, it's your forehand and only here is it your backhand. That's obviously if you're right-handed and it's reverse if you're a lefty and it's obviously talking as if your forehand is your strength. Those three tips, returning back up the middle a lot. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you this and I'll challenge you to your next match. In your next match, hit every single return of serve back up the middle. I guarantee you, you will be more consistent and break serve more often. Make sure that you vary the height you aim over the net. As you move back, hit higher over the net. As you move forward, aim lower over the net. And then rectangle square. Don't have it be where, well, anything on my left side is a backhand and everything on my right side is a forehand or vice versa as a lefty. If the ball comes very close to you on your backhand side, that ball should actually be a forehand and then you get many uh, advantages from there. Let's see if we have any questions. I've been putting a horse before a cart on forehand. What do you think? I like it. Uh, doo, 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 doo. Let me see if we have any. And guys, thank you so much. I believe at the bottom of the screen, when you go to comment, um, you can do a super chat. So I know many of you in the past have done super chats. I really appreciate it. And I'll definitely shout you out when you do a super chat. All right. So those are the three single strategies that I want you to try. Obviously, there are so many more. But those are the three single strategies that I want you to use in order to win more matches. All right. Let's talk about doubles. I, to be very honest with you, I love teaching double strategy. I would say this is actually my favorite topic to teach in all of tennis. Technique, footwork, strategy, singles, doubles. Double strategy is my favorite. I love it. It's so fun because if you teach it in a very simple way, the student can really soak it in and then apply it to their next match. So here is probably... I was just talking about double strategy is my favorite thing to teach. Here is my favorite strategy to teach when it comes to doubles. Here, oh, let me get rid of this. Here's my favorite double strategy to teach. Hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing. I'm going to say that one more time. Hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing. Typically, in doubles, you are going to have a one-up, one-back versus one-up, one-back situation. You have the server and the returner who are back at the baseline, and you have two net players. They aren't always the same distance from the net. Oftentimes, they aren't, but you typically have two net players and two baseliners. The idea of hitting the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing will have you being correct between 80 and 90% of the time when it comes to where you hit your shot. Where you hit the ball in doubles isn't random. It isn't a gut feeling. It isn't just, you know, draw straws or pick, a, uh, pick an idea out of a hat. You can actually use this strategy and be right the vast majority of the time. Now, if you're right between 80 and 90% of the time, that means you're gonna be wrong 10 to 20% of the time. And that's okay. You have to be okay with that. You're not gonna always be right. No one is always right. But if you can be right 80 to 90% of the time, that's gonna be a great idea. So here's how it works. You have a baseliner. The baseliner is going to hit the ball to the other team's baseliner. 
Now, let's say this is you. Are you gonna hit it to the net player? Or are you gonna hit it to the baseliner? Following the rule of hitting the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing, you're gonna hit it back to the baseliner. This is why you see often in doubles, cross court ground strokes going back and forth. Baseliners typically, and I'll, I'll explain that, uh, Seth. Uh, great question. Typically, in doubles, baseliners are better at knowing where to hit the ball. I hope my opponents don't know this shit. <laughs> I appreciate that. I hope so for your sake too. Baseliners, in my experience, and I've been teaching for 25 years, um, I've been, I started teaching June 15th of 1997. That was when I was 18 years old and I started teaching full time. Baseliners know where to hit the ball with more certainty. They know you can't just give it to the net player. So this is typically when you see cross court shots going back and forth. Now, let's say your opponent makes a mistake. They frame the ball. I mean, we all frame the ball. Everyone screws up, right? And let's say this is your partner at the net and the ball kind of floats up to your partner. And now your partner has a high ball, it has an overhead, yada, yada. Remember, following the rule, you should hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing. This opponent needs to aim uh, toward at to however you want to say it. We're not trying to hurt anybody. But you should be hitting the ball toward the opposing net player. Now, this is usually when I get a little bit of pushback, right? You say, but Ryan, why not just hit it through the middle? Well, that sounds super easy. And you'll get, I'll get in like Twitter wars and like uh, YouTube comment wars with people. And they'll say, oh, I always hit it down the middle for winners. It's like, of course, like, you know, everybody is keyboard warriors and everyone's like number one in their state or number one in their country when they, when they comment. I think we have revisionist history when we talk about the way we play tennis, um, including myself. Like we, we, we oftentimes forget the mistakes that we have and we only remember the really good shots that we have. I can tell you if you hit through the middle, what you end up doing is often missing, but also you end up hitting it too close to the returner who goes over and gets it and then follows the rule of hitting the ball to the opponent who's standing where they're standing and they continue the point. If you, as a kid, do you ever play dodgeball? You know that game in, in phys ed or gym class, whatever you called it, and you got that red foam ball and you're throwing the ball at each other and if you hit the kid, he or she, they're out, right? And so you gotta hit them. Well, when you were throwing the ball, wouldn't you typically throw the ball at the kid closest to you? You wouldn't throw the ball at someone super far away because they have more time to react. So when you have, when you're at the net and you have a high ball, so this is a little bit of the caveat. And I, there was a question, um, uh, uh, in what situation would this be wrong? And, and so that's kind of what somebody just asked. When you have a high ball or medium ball, this is when you want to aim to the opponent with less time to react. You want to look for someone who has less time to react. Doubles is not, and thank you, Seth. Doubles is not about avoiding your opponents. That, there's singles versus doubles. In doubles, they've doubled the number of people on the court, two to four but they haven't doubled the size of the court. And for that reason, there's less open court. So if your mindset is to avoid your opponents, what you will actually be doing is avoiding the court because there's so little open court and you will end up missing in your attempt to avoid your opponents. You'll end up missing your shot, either hitting the net wide or long. If you embrace the fact that there's very little open court and you start actually aiming for the correct person, what ends up happening is you win more points. Plain and simple. Now, somebody asked, when would this be wrong? Okay, great, great question. Um, let's, 
take it from the standpoint of the net player because typically this is a net player situation when it would be wrong. It's when you have a low ball. So, and it could be either player, right? So let's say you come to the net and you're both up. Well, you should both be picking on the opposing net player, right? Now it's, now it's two against one. Why would you hit to this player? They have more time to react. Except if they have a low volley, your partner or you. If you have a low volley and you're down below net level, do not hit to the net player because you will pop the ball up to them and then, because you have to lift the ball, the ball's got to go up off your racket. And because of that, they then get to hit at you and you don't have enough time to react. So when I was talking about 80 to 90% of the time, you will have low volleys in doubles that you want to hit back to the baseliner or, or not even back. You just want to hit to this side of the court. Hit it to the baseliner. Now remember, the baseliner has to hit the ball to the opponent who's standing where they're standing. Well, if you're both up, who are they supposed to hit toward? They have nobody to hit toward. And you could say, oh, they're just going to lob. It, there are three things that can happen with a lob. The ball comes right to you and you slam it. It's a perfect lob or they hit it long. Typically, players hit their lobs long because they're trying to avoid you. So if, if your opponent is relying on a lob in order to beat you, you're going to beat that team. But... Being up at the net, when you have high balls, you both pick on the net player. But when you have a low volley, that's when you hit back to the baseliner, waiting for that higher ball. So if the only strategy in doubles you know and use is hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing, you will look like a tennis genius on the court. Even if it's you know, not typically what you do. If you're typically a singles player and you don't know where to hit the ball, start hitting the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. You will just magically just always choose the right, or not always, but 90% of the time you'll be choosing the right shot. So really, really great strategy. All right, number two has to do with when you lob. Uh, well, uh, I'm actually, let me do kind of like a 1A here with this last strategy. The number one double strategy mistake, and I touched upon it a little bit, but I want you to start noticing this. About a year and a half ago, my wife got a new car and I didn't notice the car that she got on the road, right? You ever done that? You ever bought like a new car or like, you know, gotten a new car as a family? And all of a sudden when you get that car, you start noticing it around. You're like, wow, I never realized how many of these cars were on the road. Like how many people have this car, right? It's the same thing. Once, once I present this to you, now you'll be able to recognize it. I want you to watch your local doubles league. I want you to watch some of your teammates. Maybe if you're on a USTA or club team, you know, in your local area, the number one double strategy mistake is overheads being hit to the baseliner. And when I say number one, I mean, it, I mean it in two ways. It's number one because it happens the most. And it's number one because it's the most detrimental to your chances of winning. I want you to start noticing how many overheads are hit to the baseliner. If you have an overhead, you should be ending the point. And the way you do that is by hitting it to the net player. That's a little different way of explaining it that, that as I just talked about in the first strategy there, um, hit the ball to the opponent who's standing where you're standing. But the overhead being hit to the baseliner, now that I've mentioned it to you, you're going to start noticing it all the time when you watch doubles now. You'll be like, oh my gosh, they're constantly hitting overheads to the baseliner. And you're going to know they shouldn't be doing that. And if you're a coach, you need to drill this. Put a cone, put a pickup tube, put your ball basket on the service line and just give your opponents overheads and start getting them to hit the ball toward that player. Big, big opportunity to win more points. All right, let's talk about lobbing. So let's say this is you. And, and I'm actually gonna pose this as a question. And let me see if I can, so 
if you're here, if you're watching this right now, uh, Ryan, you're an amazing coach, thank you. Uh, I've started playing tennis in my 45 years uh, and watching tons of your videos. Thank you for helping enjoy this beautiful game. Um, greetings from Central Europe. Amazing. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it, Jan. All right. So this is you and you lob over your opponent's head. You lob the ball. Remember, your job is to avoid this person. So typically that means hit cross court. But if they're getting, you know, a little, a little dangerous over here and they're trying to poach that ball and they're trying to intercept it and they're nailing it at your partner or they're getting tight to the net, it might be a good strategy to, to hit a lob down the line. So I want you to tell me in the comments right now, if you're watching this, I got 49 of you watching right now, where should your partner and you go when you lob over your opponents? I want you to write it in the comment section right now. And by the way, if you're watching this, please hit the like button. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, go to the service line. All right. Y key. Or I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, it maker 5,000. We got 44 saying to the net. Uh, we got maker saying to the service line. We got Luis saying to the service line. Got a lot of service line people. We got uh, Miss Lil, uh, Linana Nader. I don't know how to pronounce that. Sorry. I completely butchered that. I'm horrible with reading and names. So I got, uh, Lina Nader, <laughs> Lena Nader, uh, saying to the net. So I've got net and service line. I got, that's kind of the, 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 the idea here. Let's see. Come on. One more, one more. Let's get one more person to answer this. Should you go to the service line? Should you go to the net? The question, Mike, DJ Mike. The question is, when you lob over your opponent, let's say you lob down the line, where should your partner and you go? So we've got service line, DF is saying service line, I'm gonna wait for Mike. Yep, like Terminator, <laughs> I like it, I like it. Come on, Mike, let's see. Center line, baseline. So Mike is saying baseline, service line, all right. Here's how it works. For all of you who said service line, you're 99% right. Uh, uh, service line one, other net. All right, so here, here's the thing about that. And I knew someone was gonna answer with that. I am not a fan of that whatsoever uh, because what it ends up doing, oh, there it is, Maker, you got it. You got it, you got it, Maker. Look at that, everyone clap for Maker. Look at you. Um, the reason I said 99% is because you want to be very specific with what you want to do. Watch what you want to do. Watch your videos. <laughs> good, good, good. You want to put your toes on the service line. Just start in your next match. When you lob or when your partner lobs, you and your partner need to put yourselves right on the service line with your toes on the service line. Here's why. What we want to do is understand what shot our opponent is gonna go for. Yeah, I know, right? I know. So here's what typically happens. This player switches, and we're gonna, let, we're gonna talk about that actually, because this player moves straight across. And then this player moves over. What shot, now really think about this in your, your tennis experience. What shot does this player typically hit? Anybody wanna respond? And guys, if you're loving this, um, this live, it would mean the world to me and my family if you did a super chat or super comment. Uh, so a super thanks, so thank you so much. You can, when you uh, comment, you can do a super thanks uh, to donate to the channel, so thank you. Um, what type of shot does this player typically hit? Cross court deep, love it. Cross court deep, yep. And I think 44, that's an interesting answer. Wasn't 44 the one who said net? Ah, A train 44. I want you to think about the two answers you just gave. You said go to the net, but then you correctly knew that your opponent might be attempting a cross court deep shot. Um, think about that. 
What typically happens is your opponent lobs. That is what typically happens. Your opponents in real time are not noticing where you're running. Right? When your opponent, I'm just being honest with you, when your opponent lobs, your moon ball, exactly. When your opponent, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yes, when your opponent lobs over your partner and you're running it down, you're not looking at your opponents. You're looking only at the ball. That's what you're looking at. And that's what your opponents are looking at. And so what typically occurs is a lob back. That is what typically occurs. And, and uh, A-Train 44, think about the answer that you gave initially, right? Because what we want to do is we want to empathize. We want to put ourselves in our opponent's shoes, think about the shot that they're going to go for, and then we want to be able to handle it quite easily. So because this person is most likely going to lob, we want to know what what could happen with their lob. They might lob high and deep. Well, since your toes are on the service line, I'll tell you this right now. If you and your partner are toes on the service line, not a single player in the world can lob you and get that ball to go over your head. Not one. Novak Djokovic himself cannot lob over your head and get the ball to go in. And the reason is because you're not stuck on the service line. You take two steps back and no lob is going over your head and then landing right on the baseline. It's not gonna happen because you can just go back and hit an overhead. But what else could happen? You're on the service line, your toes are on the service line, your opponent hits a lob and it's short. Well, the ball is high. You just run in three steps and now you follow strategy number one, hit the ball to the opponent who's standing where you're standing, and you correctly aim for the net player who stayed at the net when they crossed, which is incorrect, and we'll talk about that. When you put your toes on the service line, both of you, it allows you to handle as many shots as possible. All the different shots that I'm receiving, cross-court passing, moon ball, short in the court, cross-court deep, right? We're getting all of these answers. What does that mean? We don't know what our opponent is going to do. So what we want to do is be in the situation for as many of those shots as possible. So you put your toes on the service line and then you can get the highest number of shots that your opponent can possibly hit. It would not be smart for your opponent to go for a passing shot right now. It's just not smart. You're gonna, if they go for a pass, that means they're trying to avoid you, which means, as we learned, there's very little open court, so they are going to miss more often than they make, and that's good for you. That's a good percentage. So they typically should be lobbing. The reason I say put your toes on the service line is because a few years back, uh, into their feet, half volley would be tricky to deal with. You're right. You're 100% right. But if you go like this, TM, then the comment would be, Oh, well, if you're that close, then a really high lob over your head would be really tricky. Look, tennis is tricky. That's why we're not number one in the world. Tennis is hard. What we're trying to do is increase the likelihood that we win. That doesn't mean guarantee that we always win, right? I, I, I know I'm kind of, I'm always going into these little tangents, but do, you, do all of you know what percentage of the points we're trying to win? What per, because let's get really into the nitty gritty here. Let's get into the numbers. What percentage of the points, the entire match, what percentage of the points are, yeah, right, right, good, Tim, TM, I meant to say, what percentage of the points are we trying to win? Does anybody know what percentage of the points we're trying to win? Not what percentage of the games, not what, what percentage of the sets, what percentage of the points are we trying to win in order to basically guarantee that we win the match? Do you know what the magic number is? You know what the magic number of points is that we're trying to win? So we got A train saying 51. Does anybody know? Like if you win a set, <clears throat> well, it would obviously be over 50%, right? We're trying to win more points than we lose. What percentage of the points are we trying to win? We got Nick saying 55 to 60. If you win a match 6-3, six, 6-3, three, six, three, do you know what percentage of the points you most likely won? is what percentage of the points we got 53 
We got Bod saying 53. Rudy saying 60. The points, that 55, you got it, Richard. It is 55. 55% 55 of the points is the magic number that you're trying to win. You are trying to win 55% of the points, which means what? Your opponent wins 45%. If you want to win Wimbledon, if you want to win Wimbledon, you basically have to be willing to lose 45% of the points. You have to lose 45% of the points, which people are not willing to do. When you say that to someone, they say, 45, I have to lose 45% of the points, 45 out of 100 points. That's how I win? Yes, that's how you win. We are not trying to win every point. So I don't want you to try to poke holes in what I'm saying, right? You don't have to poke holes into what I'm saying because the holes are already poked. We're already losing 45% of the points. What we're trying to do is in a situation where we're most likely going to lose or we're, gonna, we're most likely going to win 30%, maybe we can bump that up to 35%. In a situation where we're currently winning 60%, maybe we can bump that up to 70%. What we're trying to do is take all the situations in tennis and increase the likelihood that we win those situations just a little bit so that we kind of increase, if you think about school and grade point average, you win all the percentages of all the different situations that you play in tennis to, to when you culminate them all together, it's 55% of the points. I play versus my 5-0 buddy and win like 30% of the points and lose 6-0, 6-0. Yeah, absolutely. That's what happens. So you win three out of 10 points. So what happens is if you play him in a tiebreaker, let's say you play a tiebreaker, you know, to 10, he's going to beat you 10 to 5. And you're going to say, man, I'm doing so well in tiebreakers. Why am I not doing well in the match? It's because you don't get credit for points in a match. Because if he wins the game at, at deuce, you know, add in and he wins, you won some points, but it doesn't show in the score. So you lose six love, six love, even though you won a lot of points. So when you, oh, this is, this is what I was saying at the beginning of what I just went through here with the 55%. The reason I talk about putting your toes on the service line is because I noticed in the drills and the clinics that I was running at the club where I used to coach, the players knew to go to the service line, but they would always go too far up. And I would say, no, go to the service line. And they'd go up here and they would be five feet in front of the service line. And they would kind of argue like, Ryan, I was on the service line. I'm like, well, George, you weren't on the service line. You were five feet in front of the service line. And exponentially, the chances of the ball going over your head increase. And now you're out of position. You're moving back when you could have been on, on, you know, on balance. So by saying put your toes on the service line, now the likelihood of the student as the coach, I need to get you to do what I'm asking you to do, uh, the chances go way up. So when you lob your opponent in doubles, put your toes on the service line. Now, I wasn't planning on teaching you this, but let's just go right to it. What should this team do? Typically, you see, right, you lob, and this team should go to the service line. Typically, what you see is this player stay at the net, and this player goes over. I don't want you, if this is you, to stay at the net. I want you to move back. Because if your opponents do the right thing, and the ball goes up and they're gonna slam the ball, if you're back, you have more time to react to that overhead. So when you lob your opponent in doubles, you put your toes on the service line, which means if this is you, and you, you're, if this is you and your partner lobs, you actually need to move back to put your toes on the service line. Your partner moves up, this player should go back as that player goes over. And then the chances for both teams of winning goes up. If this player stays up when they switch, they're a dead duck. Well, you know, 80% of the time, this ball is going to be a floater or a weak ball, and then that person gets slammed. Um, oh, and this is actually the last idea that I was going to talk about. When you are lobbed, and I just touched upon it, but let's get into the, into the details here. When this is you, and the ball goes over your head, this is you. When the ball goes up over your head, first, you should be trying to hit an overhead. Don't be the player who ducks and says, switch, and they duck out of the way. The first thing you should be doing is trying to hit an overhead. 
because you want to be able to go back and cover your area of the court. So don't just, if the ball goes over your head, just say switch and start moving. Try to go back and hit an overhead. But if you cannot, you cannot stay at the net when you switch for the reasons I just explained. You must go back. And I teach go to at least no man's land to at least see what your partner does and watch them hit the ball. You can watch this team a little bit because you're not hitting. You can watch this team a little bit and see what they're doing. But I want you to move back at least to no man's land, not because you want to stay there, but because you want to see what your partner does. If they hit a down the line shot and the opponent stayed back, well, then you can come forward again. If your partner hits a weak ball right to the opposing net player, then you should continue moving back so that if the ball comes to you, you have more time to react. So when it comes to doubles, the number one strategy we talked about, and this is my absolute favorite strategy to teach because it absolutely <laughs> changes the landscape of a, of a tennis match. And if you start doing this, let's say you lose the first set and then you start copying the strategy, winning percentage goes way up. Hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. Hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing. If you're in the back, hit the ball to the back person. If you're up and the ball comes to you, nail it at the feet of the opposing net player. Baseliners hit to baseliners, net players aim for net players. One example where you're going to not copy this strategy is if you are at the net with a low volley. That's that 10% of the time where I would say only about 10% of the shots in doubles are actually you close to the net with a low volley. I mean, we think about, oh, it happens all the time. Well, yeah, that's probably 10% of the time. So when you have a low volley, don't pop it up to the net person, hit it to the baseliner. But when you have any ball that's above net level, whether it's a head level volley, chest level volley, or an overhead, you're hitting the ball at the opposing net player. Hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. Number two is when you lob and this team switches, you and your partner put your toes on the service line. I always get pushback on this, but no matter what you do, there is going to be a way for your opponent to attack you or that you squander the opportunity to attack them. If you both are behind the baseline, well then if they pop the ball up, then you're too far back to hit an overhead and it gives this person time to back up even if you come in and slam an overhead out of the air. If you both move super far in, then your opponent has an easier time lobbing over your head. If you have one person up and one person back, what if they lob it deep like here? You, you kind of both run into it and if you're left-handed, you both kind of have like a backhand overhead. It's, it's just too many holes. If you just put your toes on the service line, it gives you the greatest opportunity to handle the shots they hit. Remember, we're only trying to win 55% of the points over the entire match. So it's okay to lose points. We just want to, on average, win more points than we lose. And when you are lobbed, this is you. When you are lobbed over your head, do not move straight across. Move back at an angle and watch your partner hit the ball. Watch what they do, whether they drive the ball, whether they lob the ball. By watching them hit the ball right off their racket, you know what they hit rather than staying at the net. You see this all the time. This person moves across and they're like, what happened to the ball? What, what's going on? Because this player is looking at the hitter. This player is looking at the hitter and the, play, the hitter knows what they're doing. This player's lost. They, they don't know where the ball is. So just move back at an angle into no man's land at least. And you could even just simply say, go to the baseline and I'd be fine with that as well. Uh, and then the chances of winning the point go way up in that situation. So to go over this again, we talked at the beginning of this live 48 minutes ago. And for those of you watching, thank you so much. If you love this, it would mean the world to me if you did a super chat. So feel free to, um, when you do a chat, you'll see um, a chat. You can see you'll, you'll, there's, a, there's an option to do a super chat. So for a couple dollars, it comes up big and then I'll make a big shout out for you. Um, here's singles strategy, three tips that are gonna help you win more matches. Tip number one, return back up the middle. And I see a serve and volley question and I'd be happy to answer it. When you are returning serve, I want you in your next match, try it out, you got it, you got it. 
In your next match, I want you to hit back up the middle. I want you to return serve back up the middle. Watch how consistent you become. If you don't make the return, you can't uh, break serve. And if you don't break serve, you can't win a match. You have to hit the like button, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, return back down the middle. You don't have to um, be super aggressive on the return. Oftentimes, you'll see players hit winners on the return in the pro game, but it sometimes happens that they miss their target, that maybe they were going down the middle and they were a little late and it ended up becoming a winner. So return back up the middle, watch how you break serve more often. Number two, vary the height you hit over the net. 100% of the time, you should know exactly how high you're trying to hit the ball over the net. An exact means low, medium, or high. That's it. I'm not talking inches like, oh, like, Ryan, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna hit 48 inches over the net. No, what you're trying to do is just have in your mind, low, medium, or high. As you move in, this is in a baseline rally. As you move inside the court, aim low. As you move back way behind the baseline, aim high. And it's a scale like this. As you move in, you aim low. As you move back, you aim higher to account for the change in the distance you're trying to make that ball go. What players typically do is they vary the speed they hit the ball when what you should actually be doing is varying the height you hit over the ball. And last, the square and rectangle idea where if you are right-handed, and I'll do it as a lefty, if you are right-handed, that any ball that lands in this rectangle is a forehand, and any ball that lands in the square, you can hit us backhand. Now, as your level of play goes up, you might move this line to like over here. You might be like, whoa, my rectangle is much bigger for forehands. And you might be able to get way over here and really dominate with your forehand. You're giving up more court, but you're also being more aggressive because you're hitting your strength. But I don't want you to think that, oh, a ball that's on the left side of the court is your backhand and the ball on the right side of the court is your forehand. Or you know, if it's a lefty, that this is your backhand and this is your forehand. It's not. Figure out a way to dominate more with your strength. I heard an amazing stat several years ago, uh, and I heard it from Craig O'Shaughnessy, or O'Shaughnessy, and he said that in Federer's career, now this is amazing, in, in Roger Federer's career, he hit, he has hit more forehands while standing on this side of the court. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not misrepresenting what I heard, so, but you're gonna think I'm nuts. Federer has hit more shots while standing, more forehands while standing on this side of the court than he has hit forehands on this side of the court. Think about that. Hey, you got it from Berlin. Amazing. Think about that. The, that Roger Federer has hit more forehands in his career on the ad side of the court. You'd be like, what? Like, what? Wouldn't he hit more forehands while standing on this side of the court? But if you were going to play Roger Federer, would you hit to his forehand or would you hit to his backhand? So the opponents are constantly hitting the ball to the ad side of the court, trying to get him to hit a backhand. So if he wants to hit a forehand, he's going to have to move around it and hit on the ad side of the court. It's, uh, bod, body, it, it is amazing to hear this. Um, I heard it from, from uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy, who has been hired and was in the box for one of Djokovic's Australian Open wins, you know, one of his many. <laughs> um, uh, what, what does he won, like eight Australian Opens or something? Uh, I forget, it's like a ridiculous number. He, he owns the Australian Open. But uh, a couple years ago, uh, Djokovic beat Nadal handily, straight sets, in the Australian Open final. And you look in the player's box, and there's Craig O'Shaughnessy, who he paid to strategize and come up with a plan. Craig O'Shaughnessy, the leading statistician in WTA and ATP tours. Uh, so just an amazing stat. So hit down the middle on the return, vary the height over the net, and try to hit more forehands as long as, as that's your strength. When it comes to doubles, hit the ball to the opponent who is standing, let's do it on this side. 
hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing, right? So the ball comes to you. The vast majority of the time, you're a baseliner, just hit it to the other team's baseliner. Here's something I didn't say when I first talked about this. When you're in the back, your job in doubles is not to end the point. When you end the point as a baseliner, you only win the point 25% of the time. That is a Craig O'Shaughnessy stat. The pros, when they are at the baseline and the shot they hit ends the point, which means what? It's a winner or an error, right? They either hit a clean winner or they hit an error. 25% of the time when you win the, when you end the point, it's a winner. That's on the pros. 75% of the time, it's an error when your shot ends the point. You hit the net, you hit wide, you hit out. So your job as a baseliner is to prolong the point. Your job as a baseliner in doubles is not to end the point. Let's talk about what happens when you end the point as a net player. Did you know that on the pro tour, net players in doubles, when they end the point, they win the point 66% of the time. So let's just bump that up to 67, which is, you know, whatever. It's, it's two thirds. When you're at the net and you end the point, you win two points for every one you lose. So your job at the net is to end the point. Your job at the baseline is to prolong the point. So if you're at the net and you have an overhead, don't hit it to the prolonger. Don't hit it to the person whose job is to prolong the point. Hit it to the person who ends the point. The net player who doesn't have enough time to react. So baseliners hit to baseliners, net players nail it at net players. That is why at the baseline you're trying to avoid the opposing net player because they easily slam it at your partner at the net who has no time to react or very little time to react. Strategy number two is when you hit a great lob over your opponent's heads, you and your partner need to immediately move to the service line. You wanna combine shots with movement. Combine shots with movement. So anytime you're attempting a shot, you have to have in your mind, okay, where am I, where am I gonna go if I'm successful with this shot or if I'm not successful with this shot? If you are attempting a lob, you have to know that if you are successful, that you need to immediately move to the service line. It's no different than in baseball. When you're hitting a baseball, the moment you hit the ball, you've got to run to first base. Now in baseball, it's simple because you have one place to go. You hit the baseball, you immediately run to first base. It's so simple. You don't have to think. In, in doubles, it's hard because there's no like actual place telling you where to go. But anytime you hit a shot, you need to know what you're gonna do, whether you're successful or not successful with the shot that you attempt. So when you hit the lob, you and your partner put your toes on the service line. Put your toes on the service line. Your opponents will most likely switch. Most likely this person stays at the net, which is incorrect, which we'll talk about in the last idea. With your toes on the service line, now the chances of dominating the chances of winning more than 55% of the points goes way up. And then both you and your partner pick on the person with very little time to react. And that takes us to a third idea. When you are lobbed, and so now this is you, and your opponent lobs over you, do not move straight across when you switch. Right? <laughs> so there was a, a group of women I taught this was about two years ago. There was a group of women I was teaching and they kept, when they would say switch, they would go switch. And like they were all laughy and giggly and they, they were saying switch as if it wasn't that big a deal. And so I said, you know what? Hey, what's up? What's up, Joseph? Um, when I told them, I said, look, instead of saying switch, I want you to say, oh crap. And it was funny, right? But what I was trying to get them to do is understand that when a lob goes over the head, it is that you, you need to realize, and thank you so much, Worms. I really appreciate that. 
Uh, I'm so glad that I'm your favorite channel. I wanted them to understand that this is bad. That when a lob goes over your head and doubles and you're supposed to switch, it's not switch, it's, oh crap, we're in trouble. Because no one says, hey, I hope in this next point we get lobbed and have to switch. Who says that? Nobody, it's a bad thing, right? It's, it's a bad thing. So when you get switched, in your, when you have to switch in your mind, just say, just say, oh crap. You can say switch, but go, oh crap, this isn't good. So don't stay at the net. When the ball goes over your head and your partner comes over and gets it, move back diagonally. Don't move like an Etch-a-Sketch. You know, you know, like on an Etch-a-Sketch, those things where the ball always have the hello from Italy, that the ball always, or like on an Etch-a-Sketch, you always move in like an L and it like always draws Ls. To, if you're trying to go from here to here, don't go straight across and then back. Move back diagonally and watch your partner and watch what happens to the success rate when you are lobbed. So thank you all so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I absolutely love doing, I love doing lives by the way, cause I love to, to answer your questions. Oh, I have a question about serve and volley. Let's see, let's go back to where it was. There was, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, Rudy, if you couldn't hear me. Uh, there was, if you are serve, uh, volleying, should the first volley always go to the same side that the serve went to? No, uh, emperor of socks. <laughs> um, so when you are dealing with a low volley, so we, we talked about this, uh, you know, uh, a, a little bit, we touched upon this idea a little bit. You serve... You come forward, and by the way, when you serve and volley, you should serve, take three steps, and then split step. So the split step in doubles, well, the split step in singles too, but the split step on a serve and volley happens in the middle of no man's land. That's where you're gonna split step because that's where you'll be as your opponent is hitting the ball, and you have to split step as they're hitting, right? So you're gonna split step in the middle of no man's land because based on the speed of your serve, that's where you go. Go ahead and just test that, right? Just film yourself hitting a serve and running forward and have somebody on the other side returning serve. Watch where you are when they're making contact, right? Like scroll through the video and stop the video when the ball is touching your opponent's strings. Look where you're standing. You will not be on the service line. Nobody is that fast. Nobody. You're gonna be in the middle of, unless you hit like a dinky serve, but then why would you wanna serve and volley on that? You gotta hit a good serve to serve and volley. So you're gonna be in the middle of no man's land. So. Split step in the middle of no man's land, which is typically three steps. If your opponent hits a high ball that you come in and have a high ball up here, then you can pick on the net person because you can drive the ball, you can hit an overhead, you can pick on that net person. If you have a low volley, if you have the low volley, that's when you're gonna hit it back to the baseline or that's that 10 to 20% of the time where following that idea is wrong that you should always hit to the person who's standing where you're standing. When you have the low volley, you hit back, and now you kind of establish yourself where no matter where this person hits, you're both picking on that person. You have a few more questions. Our tennis teacher, thank you so much. You got it, you got it. Uh, uh, good line, and your approach, is that a good approach? Okay, Serena Williams was moving one to two meters laterally at the net and doubles play with, yeah, yeah, to cover the line and or poach. Is that a good uh, idea? That gets into whether the opponent is hitting a forehand or backhand, right? So <laughs> let, let's talk about that question. When your opponent is dealing, let's say it's on the ad side. Let's go with ad side first. Let's say this is Serena. I would teach Serena, if your opponent has a backhand, be ready to poach it. But if they have a forehand, be ready to cover the line. So knowing when to poach or knowing when to predict a cross-court ball, because when you're poaching, you're predicting a cross-court ball. When you're poaching, you typically want to be poaching on an outside ground stroke because outside ground strokes get pulled cross-court. But if you're dealing with your opponent hitting an inside ground stroke, they can hit down the line quite easily. So when your opponent has an easy inside ground stroke, inside meaning toward the center of the court, you don't wanna be poaching because they're, most, they're more likely to actually hit up the line. Your opponents may not realize this and you may not realize this, but your opponent and you often pick your target based on which side of the body you're hitting on. 
Like, this is one of those things that maybe you don't realize you're doing, but I promise you, you are. When we get a backhand, if you're right-handed, when you get a backhand on this side, you will hit that ball cross court more often than if you get a forehand. You will actually choose the down the line shot more often than you would if you're hitting on the outside. You're not gonna hit it down the line backhand very often uh, or attempt it. Uh, again, I'm generally speaking, I don't know everybody who's watching this, um, but generally speaking, the side of the body that your opponent is contacting on can actually tell you uh, where they're gonna hit. So what I would tell you, and you know, you're covering the, the poach and you're covering the alley, I would say if you want an easy way to know when your opponent is going to hit the ball cross court, it is when they are right-handed on the ad side with a backhand. If they have a backhand, they are hitting that ball cross court. And if you see that, you go like this, they hit it right to you. And then where should you hit that ball? Where should you hit that ball? Remember, you hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And for all of you who commented, it means the world to me. So I'll talk to you guys all real soon. You got this.